So, without further ado, the state of web exploit toolkits. Yeah, so uh, first off, I just want to thank everyone for coming to the last talk on the last day of uh, Black Hat. So, so quite a few more people than I expected. Uh, a little bit nervous, but. So uh, I'm going to be talking about the state of web exploit toolkits, which is a lot of uh, what I've been doing at my job. And, you know, I am the lead for our advanced security intelligence team at HPDB Labs. And so a lot of what my job is, is to deal with malware. Uh, analyze it, try to figure out ways to, to determine reputation. We do a lot of malicious content harvesting. And so, you know, with something like web exploit toolkits that are becoming more popular, more prevalent in the wild, it's something that popped up on my radar and, you know, it's been becoming a very interesting topic for me to, uh, you know, to continue researching. And so, so uh, well, uh, if you're not familiar with them, web exploit toolkits are you know, the Prepackaged software that generally consists of an installer uh, has a, a lot of them are PHP based uh, and they have a database backend. It's normally MySQL. They include a large number of exploits and most of these exploits actually target uh, known vulnerabilities uh, that are already patched and they're rarely zero day. Uh, there is one instance of a zero day vulnerability being in these things. And another interesting and important thing with some of the like we can actually get some of these PHP files in raw form, but they're actually using the IonCube PHP encoder, which encrypts the PHP file, and uh, so you, it's very di it's difficult to recover. There are services out there that uh, you know they claim to be able to decrypt these uh, um, decrypt these uh, uh, this, this encoding, but we I've never found any that actually really work. And a lot of these also have uh, fancy control panels where you can go through and they'll show statistics on, um, say this will be about what countries are your visitors coming from, uh, what browsers are they using, uh, like uh, what exploits have been launched and successful. Um, and so it's, and, and you, get, you end up getting quite a bit of information from that. And then also you can configure which exploits you want to use and which, uh, um, excuse me, um, and which, which payloads you actually want to also launch. And so it ends up being, you know, very similar to a normal web application. And where they differ is where, well, their whole goal is to install a malicious payload, uh, some piece of malware. It's been used a lot to build up botnets, uh, Trojans and, you know, fake AV ransomware type stuff. And so it ends up being, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you know, it's just a way for, easy way for any uh, cyber criminal to easily um, easily uh, build, build something up and, and make money. And so um, a lot of these kits, they can cost thousands of dollars. Uh, some of them are free, but you know, some of them are very expensive. Uh, you can also do rentals. And the rentals, it's uh, daily, monthly, uh, weekly type stuff. And, uh, and so when, and they actually do like a similar model of uh, you know, maybe a day costs a uh, hundred dollars, but then for a week it costs five hundred. So it's like to get you up to that next level, they'll offer you a discount to try to to get you to go up. And so then they also do um, a bulletproof hosting, which is uh, you know hosting on their their uh, you know their hosting servers where you're not going to get taken down by any kind of stuff because it's uh, you know hosted by cyber criminals, so they're not going. They're not going to obey law enforcement's request to uh, remove it, and they, a lot of times they'll contain uh, agreements for like EULAs, where it's like you have permission to do this with our kit. You cannot resell it. You cannot disclose what's in it. You cannot, uh, you know, you know, just kind of it's like what you expect to see with normal software, and that's where it becomes really interesting because it's uh, functions. You know, the economy is built up like a legitimate software business, but in the underground. So it's. They, uh, it gets really interesting because they also, there's uh, marketing and like uh, competitiveness between kits where they, uh, where like one kid will say, we're better than this kit because we have exploits A, B, and C. And another kid will say, well, they stole those from us. And, uh, and so it's just like the whole uh, back and forth between these guys. And, you know, the other way that they mimic normal software is, 
they do a lot of bug fixes, they do reliability updates for exploits uh, if people complain, and they also do aesthetic changes. Uh, I've seen kits, you know, with, when a new version comes out, they're like, oh, we added a new spinner into our control panel, or we made this uh, statistics look nicer. And so it ends up being, you know, very interesting just from that perspective of they actually, you know, you know it's, uh, there's like a feedback loop between them and their uh, customers. So um, this is an image that I uh, borrowed from KU Securities blog who, who talks a lot about these things and who's definitely been uh, someone who, like, if I kind of am stuck on something, I'm trying to find something new that, trying to verify a trend. Like he's, he's one of the guys who, uh, who's definitely been a big help. And so he's talking about you know, a lot of the, the active kits that are out there. So it's like, I'm gonna talk about Black Hole a lot, uh, and then Phoenix. And you also see in the older kits like Eleanor, uh, Bleeding Life. And you also see uh, Red Kit, which I don't cover, but actually has some, uh, like, I believe it has some uh, byte code obfuscation. It's Java exploits. Um, so it's just like, you know, some other interesting features that are uh, coming around in these kits. Um, and so the, uh, the typical way that these kits work is, you know, so you see the red exploit kit server. Um, they're going to, either, normally they'll try to go out and find a, a, a vulnerable website. They'll, uh, they'll attempt to compromise it, inject their uh, malicious JavaScript that ends up redirecting uh, any, visit, any potential visitor uh, to their site to this other site, and then you know they'll do uh, the typical uh, browser detection, see if you're running a, uh, if they have an exploit for whatever browser version you're running, um, to see if you have any plug, if you're running any plugins that they may have an exploit for, and uh, and if they detect it, then they will attempt to exploit you, and if they exploit you, then you know they will end up loading. Their malware, and then you can actually go into these. Uh, the, you can also go into the the control panel on this kit, and you'll actually see a list of everyone who you've uh, currently compromised. And so you, then you can you can also manage them from there. Um, so um, yeah, so the first kit I'm really going to dive into is uh, Black Hole, and um, you know it's it's been around hasn't even been around for a couple of years. Uh, it's you know it's almost two years now. Um, it's definitely become the most popular kit on the market, um, and I'm basing a lot of that on what I've seen on uh, using sites like malware domain list, URL query, uh, just and also our malicious like what we how we all the samples we collect from other places. Uh, we're actually seeing lots of lots and lots of instances of this kit versus other kits. And so um, I believe the last version was one, two, three. They may have just recently updated it because they did just add a few new exploits. And um, a lot of the exploits that they've been been using have been uh, you know, targeting Java vulnerabilities. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit more, uh, I guess, in a, a couple of slides. But and then they also um, so at the time there was a Microsoft XML vulnerability that was discovered in June um, that was. Uh, at the time, it was zero day. It was being actively exploited. Um, you know, researchers were able to find uh, version copies of this page that were in the wild and um, and you know actively targeting people. And so we're like, you know, people were posting about this, and uh, the kid authors also saw this, and they took these pages and they adapted them and got them into their kit. And so they were actually able to get it into Black Hole. Um, be, while it was still on patch, and it was uh, patched a few weeks ago, so thankfully it's a, uh, you know, there's uh, protection out there for it. And one of the the biggest things that Java, Black Hole does is uh, JavaScript obfuscation. So they they always they constantly change it and tweak it a little bit just to try to just stay one step ahead. And uh, you know, so we've actually done a lot of running URLs that we find through our sandbox and watching the results, watching the behavior of how it makes URL requests, which exploits are loaded. And you know, it's, it, uh, you know, it, at the end of the day, it doesn't do anything super sophisticated, but they do enough sophistication to keep staying, to try to stay one step ahead. Um, 
And so this is just a slide with, uh, you know, this was, these were news stories from uh, 2011 that of uh, black hole, you know, being, it was in the news a lot. And, you know, so, um, you know, in mid-May of uh, 2011, they made a version free while they still kept their, uh, the newer versions paid. So there's like a, here's a sample. If you like this, keep, uh, you know, come back to us and, you know, buy the full version. And they also had, uh, they also were able to compromise the United States Postal Service and redirect a lot of visitors there to versions of their kit. And um, they also did the same thing with MySQL.com. And uh, then they also have done, you know, they're doing lots of spam campaigns these days, um, trying to install various versions of Spy, Zeus, Carver, uh, using, you know, fake Facebook friend requests. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the, some of the stuff. Uh, and, and uh, you know, this is just kind of a timeline of a lot of events that happened in 2011. Uh, some of them I just talked about. Um, early in the year, there was an ad server network that was compromised, and uh, that was one of the first big stories I saw about Black Hole. And they, uh, they've also, they also did a lot of SEO poisoning. Um, they ended up releasing, I guess it ended up being three different versions of their kit in 2011. And there's also the, um, the mass WordPress compromise in, uh, that was started in November targeting the, uh, as a WordPress plugin called Tim Thumb. Um, and there's a, there's a vulnerability where you could actually upload any kind of file and get it executed. And it was like, there was a patch release for this in August and no one, a large number of people running WordPress were not pat updating their, you know, this, this plugin. And so then uh, there was a, you know, a mass compromise campaign launched by people running Black Hole and they got hundreds of thousands of these uh, of WordPress blogs compromise and redirecting to black hole. Um, and then, uh, yeah. And so, um, they've also been doing uh, recently, uh, and I, was, I just saw a paper, I guess, last month from Trin Micro. They talk, they go into, they go into a lot of depth about the spam campaigns that black hole's been using. And, uh, you know, I've been collecting quite a bit myself. Um, and you know the reason they're using spam over trying to compromise the site is because it's a lot easier. You know, it's easier to spam to get a, a list of a million people and send out an email to them and try to get them to click on a link than try to find a you know a popular enough website to uh, that, that has a vulnerability that you can exploit or right? SQL injection, cross-site scripting to get your your stuff in there to redirect them. And you know they're. The amount of spam that they're generating is significantly rising. Um, so uh, a lot of these that I've seen have been um, like fake delivery notices for UPS and FedEx. Uh, around, and I saw a lot of that around the holidays. Uh, so it's definitely they're also using contextual stuff like that. Uh, you know, fake IRS tax notices around tax time in, a in April, which is for uh, people not in the U.S. Uh, from the U.S. And uh, then, you know, just fake orders from Amazon, other places. You know, so you go in there, you see this link saying, hey, click here to go uh, see more info. You end up going to Black Hole site and you end up getting owned. And so um, this is just some screenshots of, you know, the control panels uh, that Black Hole uh, uses. These I actually, I borrowed from uh, Xylitol's blog. Uh, um, so he also does a lot of work on exploit kits, and he's really awesome. And uh, you know, a lot of this stuff, it's you know, uh, yeah, he his information has helped out a lot. Uh, so up here, you see, uh, like on the upper right, you'll see uh, like different exploit uh, percentages. Um, you'll see browser visitor browsers and the percent of um, exploit rates. You see countries visited. Um, and you'll see uh, you know, operating systems and just some general statistics that you can that, that they show. And so it's like the, what you'll see with this versus uh, like Phoenix and some of the other kits is, you know, they definitely have tried to create a much nicer look and feel than a lot of other kits in their control panel. Um, yeah, and so on this kit, you'll actually see. The, the top vulnerability was uh, Java 2011-3544, uh, Java Rhino. And it was, 
there was a patch release late last year, and this was the first one that Black Hole actually got a, like a, it was about a month after there was a, it was patched, and, you know, and so, you know, it has an 83% success rate in the wild, which is crazy. Um, you know, it's, and also the other interesting thing is that the most exploited operating system at that time was Windows 7. And so, uh, you know, doing, and, but then you see, you look at all the others and they're 10% you know, for a PDF vulnerability, 3% and extremely low. And so it's like, uh, you know, why is, why is this vulnerable? And, you know, this actually seemed to start the trend that where they added another Java exploit in early 2012, very soon after a patch, like a month after a patch was released. And they, then they just did the same thing again. And so and I was trying to figure out why, like, why aren't people patching it? You know, why is, you know, why, why is it not being nearly, you know, why is it being so successful? And so, you know, I love Reddit and, you know, I, I was, you know, browsing Reddit and, you know, the, you know, I was browsing the uh, R funny subreddit and, you know, the, basically the perfect image popped up. And because it was someone making fun of exactly this, you know, what do they say the Java update? Not today. And so it's just people, you know, ignoring, saying, oh, Java's, there's a Java update in the system tray? Nope, go away. And so I saw that, I laughed, and then I face palmed. So it was, uh, it, it was just kind of that thing that it, it perfectly exemplified the, the problem that, that, that we see in the wild. And so, um, yes, yeah, so and this is just another screenshot of the control panels where you can see different payloads loaded, um, how many times the payload has been loaded, uh, you know, six, and stuff, and more, there's a little bit more information. So, so now I'll actually get a little bit more into some of how it works. Um, and so, like, running all these things through our sandbox, we've looked a lot at uh, URLs that it uses. Uh, you know, redirects to what, where it loads its payloads. I actually found it's quite predictable uh, at the moment, at least. Um, a lot of times it's a PHP file. A lot of the time it's normally, uh, you know, showthread.php, main.php. And then they normally have a, it normally has one URL parameter and a lot of times it's actually page equals and then it's just like a, you know, 16 character hex string. Um, and it's, so it's, it's something that's very detectable, but it's like, you know, I can look at your rock and say, I'm pretty sure that's black hole, but then it's also close enough to some real URLs to where it's like, so it's, you kind of get in that spot of, I can't just stop someone from visiting that because it could be a legitimate page and I would end up getting yelled at if I did that. Um, and so, so once that's loaded and then it ends up redirecting to its uh, malware payload, a lot of times it, uh, it's normally, um, you know, so one letter PHP file, uh, w.php is what I've observed a lot. Uh, t.php is also another common one. It normally has a couple of URL parameters with this one too. And so it ends up being another thing that's very predictable, but it could easily block a lot of legitimate traffic. Uh, so it's like you have F and E as URL parameters and, you know, the values are all within very small ranges. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's like that, you know, it, it's like I can tell what you're doing, but I can't, it ends up becoming very hard to, uh, to only block that. And so, um, so the JavaScript that Black Hole uses, it's, it's uh, you know, their obfuscation techniques, they, they, they tweak them uh, uh, just a little bit. So it's like every time you go through and you're going through the uh, obfuscation, it's like, I can catch everything you're doing now, and then they tweak it just a little bit to where now you don't catch it. And uh, so it's like, they'll use uh, character separators, uh, or they'll do, I'll show an example of this in the uh, next slide. Uh, they'll do, like they'll have a text blob and a HTML element or a, or a parameter. Sometimes they actually just have a giant URL of integers. And, uh, so, uh, so they go through that, they, they, they pull this out, they'll actually do a split to turn their text blob into an array of integers if it's not already, and then they run it through a deobfuscation routine 
that ends up, uh, it normally includes another, uh, many other common obfuscation techniques like uh, you know, doing string from char codes on ints, uh, you know, using a square bracket and a quoted value to execute a function like window square bracket quote eval, um, or then they'll actually, sometimes they'll break it up so it's to like E plus V plus AL, um, or they'll actually even assign one variable to half of it and then another to do that plus the other half of it. So it's, uh, it's very common stuff that, that we see a lot. But then, um, you know, so then the, the obfuscation routine, it goes through, it, you know, like, you know, once it actually gets to the meat where it's handling this giant text blob, splits it, and then it'll uh, do a string from char code, and then it'll, uh, like, add or subtract an integer and end up building up a, a giant string that ends up uh, running through. It's normally uh, reassigned eval in JavaScript, and, and that's actually ends up being a malicious iframe that redirects to their site, and uh, and and so then then you end up getting the browser and plugin detection and you know launching and loading malware. And so here's an actual sample on on the left you actually will see uh, deobfuscated JavaScript and on the right you'll see the obfuscated JavaScript. And so and the one of the like if you see this on a page where it says please wait page is loading. That's usually one of the indicators in deobfuscated JavaScript. Of, it's like you just visit a site that's been infected by a black hole, and you should probably, you know, really, you know, get your computer scanned. Um, but then, uh, then over here, you actually see the text blob I was talking about, and this one's a little bit different, where they use a semicolon period as their separator between their values, um, and then at the Yes, like up here you see string from char code. They're actually doing some mat, like some uh, you know. Uh, so you actually see right here that's a a float value. Then they do a floor. You know that you know they end up uh, they do a lot of little tricks. But it's like you can open up a web page and look at this, and you can say that's definitely malicious. But how do I, like you know, from our perspective as an inline device? How do I stop that before it gets to what's on the left and and the you know where you know when it's transformed in the browser? So it's definitely it's like a stay on top of your you know, stay on your toes, keep on top of everything, and it ends up being a very difficult problem. And so um, they also do a lot of PF exploits, or um, but they use different obfuscation than they use in, uh, in their JavaScript. So they do a lot of ASCII character replacement in PDFs. Uh, because you know the, the PDF uh, document parsers will actually just straight turn the turn something like uh, ampersand pound 0097 into an A, um, and, but they still will use either giant text blobs or um, um, or arrays events, and then they also uh, you know, like they'll have like multiple character separators like three at signs, but then they'll actually they'll do an ASCII character replace for the first at sign, leave the middle at sign in there, and then do another ASCII character replace on the last at sign. So it's like another thing, is it ends up being very recognizable, but like trying to figure out a way to de efficiently detect it in an automated fashion, be, uh, like in line becomes, you know, it becomes a difficult part. And uh, once this gets through the um, the obfuscation routines, it ends up following very similar patterns that the JavaScript, uh, the HTML JavaScript does. So it ends up having you know, the same purpose. And so, and so uh, they also, you know, all their JavaScript shell code, that like, you know, I've, you know, once you deobfuscate it, you can actually easily find it. They don't make an attempt to hide it. And, uh, but it also, a lot of it exhibits the same behavior. Um, it's very easily detectable. You see the standard jump call uh, patterns that you see in shell code. They do. A, they try to do a little bit of uh, obfuscation where it's like you load it up. You you don't uh, you don't see anything that looks decent. Like you can run strings on it. You won't see any URLs. But they actually do a simple XOR at the beginning of their shell code, uh, and then you end up 
at the end of it, you end up with like good assembly code that you can find a lot of strings in. You can find URLs. You can actually follow it, follow the path of execution, how it gains execution. So the, the image at the bottom is actually one of the URLs we found at the, uh, after we deobfuscated this. And you know, ends up, and the, you run the shell code through something like libemu, and it's easily detected. So they're definitely not on the forefront of you know, like evading anything like that. So you know, here's an example of, of uh, I guess, the, the left side is deobfuscated, and the right side is the obfuscated shell code. Um, and so, so there you actually see um, it's actually subtracting a negative number to get the number of bytes it wants to patch. And so that number of bytes ends up being positive. And right there, it does the, it's doing its XOR loop. And then the, that part on the right side actually ends up becoming what's on the left, which ends up being you know, the valid, valid assembly code where it actually does a bunch of jumps before it actually starts executing. And, uh, and recently, uh, they started, they implemented a pseudo-random DNS generation algorithm. And where this actually makes it harder than something like, uh, you know, recent example is flashback. Where, but uh, flashback actually, you know, all, everything with flashback use the same, you know, DNS generation algorithm. It connects to the same servers. Whereas this is actually every instance of black hole has a slightly different uh, generation algorithm. So, it, you know, and it changes every 12 hours, and it makes it a lot more difficult to, uh, you know, to catch every kit. Because before, it's like, hey, I know their bulletproof host is this DNS name. I can block it. Now it changes every 12 hours. Now it changes every 12 hours for thousands of installs. So it makes it a lot more difficult. So at the bottom, you'll actually see does a call to uh, make frame, which then ends up uh, doing a pseudo or generate pseudo random string, and on this, um, this one it's um, using dnsstuff.com, which is a uh, free dynamic DNS service. I've seen other instances of using just top level .ru's and other, and other things, and so that's and uh, and here it actually you know does a random number generator based off the time, but and there. And where it does, you know, if S is less than 12, then it's zero, otherwise it's one. So that's actually where it's using two cycle the DNS name per day. And, uh, you know, and here it actually and then it ends up pulling out, a, you know, gets a color out of the string and it generates, um, you know, it uses its uh, random, random number generator, pseudo random number generator to grab 10 characters and ends up being a, a color dash 10 random characters dot DNS stuff dot com domain name at the end of it. And so, you know, that's just, you know, they, they just recently had this, uh, I think it was like near the end of last month. So it's uh, like, they're definitely trying to add more things and keeping their place as the, the most popular kit. Um, so uh, next kit I'm gonna talk about is Phoenix. And it, it's uh, been around since 2007. It's pretty old. It's up to version three. Uh, they do many and full versions, and uh, and so so it's like you know the the difference between many and full isn't it, it's not it, they don't offer you more exploits. Uh, it's more of just like you can do multiple affiliates and not um, they do things that I've seen other kids do. Of they track if you visited the page once, and if you visited the page one time then they don't actually launch the exploit again. Which, uh, you know, when I was first playing around with these kits, I was using a curl in the command line. And I was just like having an output straight uh, to standard out. And then I'd try to hit it again, and I wouldn't be able to get it, and I'd be like, what happened? And, you know, it's because they're like, oh, we might have exploited you once already, so we don't want to try to exploit you again. Or we only want to serve the page up to you once to keep you from getting any more information than you can. And, also, because Phoenix is so old, it actually has quite a few exploits, but, you know, like many kits, they're actually fairly old exploits. And so, so here you'll see some of the statistics that um, Phoenix uses. So they have, this is their advanced statistics page where they give you a lot of information about uh, browsers and
or a basic statistics page where you can see some exploit statistics and some more browser st statistics. So it ends up being not uh, nearly as interesting or as nice to look at. Um, but the, the way Phoenix does JavaScript obfuscation is they tend to use multiple script tags followed by a text area tag followed by another script tag. And, um, and this all ends up being in a row. And so they'll actually end up pulling in, in the text area tag, they actually have a couple of variable uh, initializations that they pull out of the pull out and then they execute in one of the other script tags. But then even after you deobfuscate this code ends up being, it's not terribly obvious uh, exactly what it's doing. Um, and like with black hole, I saw a lot of references to things like git shell code or heap spray or just like if you can actually figure out a way to deobfuscate it like on the fly as you're inspecting it, you can actually, you can like, oh yeah, that's definitely malicious. With Phoenix, they don't quite follow the same patterns. And so um, this is what some of their obfuscated JavaScript looks like. At the top where the arrows are, you'll see, you know, the two script tags together. It actually ends up being much, much longer and, uh, you know, not terribly interesting, but it's, it's like one of the things you look at this and you're like, that's probably not going to do anything legitimate, but with a lot of the minifying of JavaScript, it ends up being much more difficult to um, to not like detect false positives related to this. And so uh, the PDF obfuscations that Phoenix uses, it, they resemble a lot of Black Hole's JavaScript obfuscations, um, and you know Phoenix was first, so it's likely that Black Hole definitely saw what they were doing at the time and decided to uh, you know, take it and improve upon it. And so they, they do the large array of integers, they run through the obfuscation routine, then to launch the exploit. But uh, the way they do the obfuscation is a little bit simpler than black hole. They're not doing any kind of math. You actually see that they'll, they, they reference, they use an array, they index into an array that's used to index into another array. And then they just loop over a hard-coded number of bytes. And so it ends up being, you know, and then they do an eval reassignment at the end. Um, so it ends up being you know, not terribly sophisticated and it's kind of like one, another one of those things where you're like, I can look at this, I can see it's bad, but then you know, how do I block this without blocking other legitimate things? So um, now I'll move on to some of the, the other exploit kits that have been coming out. Um, and and over in you know, like late 2011, early 2012, it seems like uh, you know, it's a lot of people have have witnessed how popular these kits are becoming, how much they've, uh, you know, how how successful they've been, and they wanted to get on the game. And there are lots and lots of new kits coming out. And you know, we've actually been quite a few coming out from China. I'm going to talk about one of them, and talk about some of the characteristics that that it exhibits and uh, other kits from China exhibit. And the interesting thing with that is. A lot, of, a lot of the kits have been coming out from Eastern Europe and, uh, and Russia. And so to come out from China actually ends up being like, you know, interesting, uh, you know, it's just kind of a new wrinkle in the game. And they've also had a number of, you know, and they also came out with a small number of exploits, but they're actually targeting more recent exploit, more recent vulnerabilities than, than the other established kits. And so then we've also seen kits pop up and disappear but you know, overall, it just ends up being a, a very large number of these things to keep up with, and because uh, you know, it's, it's kind of you know, it's kind of like a startup where everyone has a great idea and a lot of people try to follow it, but then a lot of people fail, um, so they just kind of go away and you never see them again. Um, so, so Yang Pack was actually from China, and it uh, first started seeing it in late 2011, early 2012. It was, uh, you know, it's, it's out of China. It uh, only had three exploits in it, but they were actually targeting fairly recent vulnerabilities. But also had very low detection rates on virus total. Um, so, and you know, the other interesting thing about that is they're not using JavaScript obfuscation. They're not using uh, like PHP and My, and like MySQL or anything on the back end. It's just a static HTML file with everything hard coded, and they still weren't getting detected. I mean, the detection rates were like less than 10%. Uh, right after it came out. And so, um, in case secure you, I mentioned earlier, 
he actually has a, quite a few more blogs about other kits from China. And uh, I, I reference those in the, the white paper as well. Um, the next kit is uh, Sweet, o Sweet Orange. And uh, this one was a kit that I have not been able to, I haven't witnessed in the wild, um, that I haven't seen really anyone else except for Dancho Danchev talk about in one post on Webroot. But uh, I want to talk about it here um, because of basically they've actually managed to keep their kit out of researchers' hands. And, um, and you know, like very hidden. And so it's kind of a very hard question of are they being successful with this kit or are they being, or are they, um, or are they, are they just, you know, are they just basically marketing fluff of saying, we're not going to even show you or demo this kit to you at all if, uh, if you're not an established member of Underground and we don't feel like we trust you at all. You know, they, they set a high price, especially for an exploit kit at $2,500, then renting it to you at $1,400. And uh, you know, none of the researchers I've uh, talked to have have seen this in the wild. But then again, it's we may easily have samples of it. We just haven't been able to tie it to this kit. And so, um, so these are some of the screenshots of the sweet orange. And again, you see um, very similar to like Phoenix, where you know they just throw up their numbers. Uh, they they're not trying to make it look nearly as nice as Black Hole. Um, but you know, you see, you know, country statistics, browser statistics. Uh, yeah, actually, um, you'll see some browser version statistics as well, just general statistics. Um, and it's just another, another screenshot of, you know, just their general control panel. Um, that you know, these were also taken from uh, Dancho's post. So, so the um, last kit I'll talk about is Nuclear Pack, which was actually one that. It, it popped up and then it disappeared and it didn't reappear till this year, but it only has four exploits with it. But the interesting thing about this one was that it an anti honey client slash web crawling feature um, into it just to try to prevent, uh, you know, prevent people from collecting their, uh, collecting any information about their page, collecting their exploits by, um, they actually use mouse movement as a sign of a human using the web browser. And so, you know, normal web crawlers aren't going to do that. Uh, sandboxes are similar, honey clients as well. Um, and so it's like really to detect that you kind of need more interactive, uh, you know, things to do it. And so um, this is a, this is actually their uh, anti crawling routine here where, you know, they have a document on mouse move function assigned. You actually, they have they use a you know XYZ flag to you know for various purposes and here you actually also see some ASCII character replacement type stuff. Um, then down here at the very end, it's like you know once you get a mouse move, it, then they'll end up creating a uh, a JavaScript tag that they end up appending uh, appending to the uh, head HTML element. So their JavaScript gets loaded, the exploits gets launched, and hopefully. And you know they hope that they uh, compromise you. Um, so, so yeah, in conclusion, the you know exploit kits are getting more sophisticated for, as, in terms of adding newer exploits and more recent exploits and trying to do more evasions and obfuscations. And a lot of the reason they're doing this is because they are their business uh, and these you know the guys who write these kits are trying to make money. And they're trying to protect their business model, and you know, they're definitely wanting to figure out ways to keep making more money. Um, but you know, they're not sophisticated in the sense of like the, um, unfortunately, I have to use this term, APT attacks um, that are trying to stay under the radar and you know silently exfiltrate data. These guys are just trying to get past the first level of detection to infect the computer and add it to a botnet, and then figure out ways to make money. Um, and so, you know, detecting the ways that they're adding techniques and the ways that they're doing stuff takes a lot of work and it takes constant work. Um, and there are a lot of uh, recent mitigations that web browsers are trying to add, like uh, blacklisting plugins, uh, if they detect them to be out of date. And, um, and also, you know, and, you, know they, you also see things like Flash adding in silent update features. Uh, Firefox has been at, looking at adding that in. 
Chrome does it. So it's, uh, they're definitely combating these guys and, and trying to combat them in way, many ways. And it, you know, it'll be interesting from my perspective to see how they end up, uh, how the explicit authors react to these things because they're definitely going to react, but I don't expect them to react with zero days because they don't need to use zero days because what they're doing works and it's gonna keep working as long as people don't patch or and as long as we you know, can't make people patch. So I just wanna give thanks to a lot of people, a couple of people I work with, uh, Mark Eisenbarth and Joanna Berkey and the rest of the DB Labs people. Um, they've uh, definitely been great for support and ideas and some ex-coworkers, Alan Pusick, who actually turned me on to this stuff originally. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of the researcher communities, I've probably forgotten some people, but uh, Jorge Mears and Mel were in it. Uh, you know, and you can see the rest up there. So uh, thank you, and if you have questions. So uh, one question. So I want to know uh, how many explore based on ROP based uh, uh, techniques? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? So how many explore based on ROP written to uh, original programming, these kind of techniques? Um, I haven't done a lot of the exploit, like deep analysis on the actual exploits and how they work themselves. So uh, I don't have a whole lot of information on that, unfortunately. So thank you.